Hello, everyone. This is William Samuel. At Woodsong. Part of the time at Woodsong and part of the time at Aimless. Aimless being the little houseboat that has taken Oligarch's place. Sweet Aimless that has come into Rachel's in my experience. But today I'm at Woodsong. And there seems to be a press of time. Press of time. Press of time. Precisely what is the press of time? I think likely it's felt more and more as one grows older. And I suppose it has to do with the weight of time and time's accumulation time's passing, uh, time's memory, time's age, maybe, and its auger of, of approaching deadlines. Well, if that's what is meant by the press of time... By the way, Tolstoy wrote an essay using that term without defining what he meant by time. I think it was Tolstoy. Then precisely what is the time that's doing the pressing? Just what is it? If, if it should turn out the time isn't real, but is merely a human sense of sequentiality, of passing events, then would the press of time not be real either? That is, if, if we understand time correctly, are we less likely to feel its press, its accumulations, its augurings? This is a subject about which I've had some light. Certainly I've thought, meditated, and written a great deal about it in my journals, and it's a subject that we'll take up here at length on a future tape, on a future tape, if there should be a future tape. In any event, out of this sense of oppressive time for myself, I'd like to talk just a little bit about thoughts that have come relative to this press, so far as one called Bill Samuel is concerned. You know, over the years I've been at the feet of many, and I guess that uh, relatively speaking one might say that there have been many at my feet. Yet, those who come here to visit, I'd have you understand that they are my teachers. They're not students. Just as they may appear to believe that I am their teacher or something while they're here, the fact remains that those who have come here over the years have been my teacher. Also, for many of the past 30 years, I've gone out to places to tell my story, always to those places where I've been asked to go. And as I think about it, those have been my learning experiences too. And while it may have appeared that I was in a, an auditorium or a room, standing maybe uh, at a podium or seated at a table there, the event that transpired was not as it appeared at all, not to me. Rather, I was at the feet of those in the room 
and I might put it a better way, I was at the feet of myself there, teaching me. All those rooms were filled with myself and myself was often a hard teacher making points in my heart with heat and confusion and pain and tears that only I could see and feel. Oh, well now, oh well now, this maudlin bit. What, what has come from all these years of self-inquiry? So what? So what? What about all this? These years of what one calls teaching and lecturing. You know, I recall the the helplessness of feeling something very wonderful <laughs> and, and yet being quite unable to find the words that made that feeling a tangible reality to the others in the room. I most vividly remember and feel or felt the helplessness of knowing and being the whole truth that everyone in the room was looking for, yet without the ability to make that knowing and being a conscious part of those around me, even while knowing that those around me were myself. And yet, Yet, sometimes, in rare moments, and I suspect there will be a few who listen to this, who will be the ones I have reference to. In rare moments, here or there, someone, someone in the room, or someone along the pathway, or someone sitting, sitting in the grass somewhere, some part of myself would suddenly hear and would suddenly know exactly what I was trying to say. Someone would instantly catch a glimpse and see, and see, <laughs> and see. And I wondered then, and I guess I sometimes wonder now why all of myself, why, why the whole room of myself didn't comprehend or appear to this simple secret of being about which I speak. Godhead, fount of life, presence. Well, as appearances go, as appearances go and things are not as they appear, at all. But as appearances go, where the communication, if that's the right word, where it has really taken place, has most often been here at Woodsaw, or on the river. When people have come here of their own free will and accord, not to gain something, but just because it seemed the fun thing to do. The communication has taken place when one has come knowing that it is himself, an aspect of himself, a view of himself, and hopefully an honest view of himself that he's here to perceive, and not another one called Bill Samuel, not another one called a teacher or a guru, it seems that that's when the communication has taken place. Those are the ones I hold to be. The family I am, the real family I am. Those are the ones my father has given me. Now, does that make sense? I. Someone said, 
the word of the Lord cannot be imprisoned. The word of the Lord cannot be imprisoned. That's true. The, the life behind these words cannot be imprisoned. Consequently, they can be understood. Well, those who have come out of the Eastern philosophies to study with me will perhaps understand what I mean by the statement, the secrets have been revealed to me. While that is not the best way to say it, and while that statement is incomplete, and while the secrets are not finite in number, but infinite in being, uh, the statement is true, is, is, is nearly as as uh, these words will allow it. And with the revelation of, of secrets, it has come to me, I think, as to all, as comes to all, some degree of uniqueness in that it seems to be an experience that no one else anywhere has ever had. Yet it is always the same experience, and it always comes with that feeling of uniqueness. With me has come a press of time an injunction to make what I could clear upon the tables, to not bury these secrets so-called in the sand where they are there guarded against being profane or abused, but rather to make them clear upon the tables. And I guess I've spent a long time trying <laughs> to do just that. I know, well, let me put it like this, to know what I know and to see what I see seems to be, seems to be an anomaly. Yet, I know what I see, whatever it appears to be, is the necessary delineation of beings or gods or the ineffables, infinity. So it's true, the word of the Lord cannot be imprisoned, nor can the conscious awareness of it continue to be. It has been said wisely, correctly, that there is nothing hidden that will not be revealed and that there is nothing covered that will not be uncovered. These are those days. And yet, that which is hidden and has been covered it's not complex nor difficult to understand. Rather, it's simple and easy to understand by the heart of us, by the heart of us, by the heart of us. I would like to read a part of, of two letters. have come just recently. One from one who has been here and heard and saw and has taken it home to live and be. But one also from one who who has not been here but, but attended a talk somewhere else and also after a time of tribulation and a time of wonderment, a time of trouble, 
has come to understand too and to see it and to be it and to be amazed at the simplicity of it all. So listen gently and let their words be your words. I would like to read excerpts from two letters. First from a very dear friend who has been here to visit. Uh, I mustn't read all the letter. First, the letter outlines what seemed to be quite a human problem. Those of you who have studied here know that I advocate keeping a journal within which one records the truth as one perceives the truth and that alone. Well, the letter starts, quote, I didn't have a neat little notebook to start writing in, but I did have the backs and the fronts of everything I could find to start writing what really was and what I was really seeing and what was being made plain beyond any doubt. And it became quite an experience. I would write out the truths as best I could, and then I would write what came to be written. Now, I have lived this truth, since the writing is the actual living the truth. And I said to myself, I will see the confirmation. And Bill, I did. Now, I won't take ten pages to recite the details, but the final result was, was a healing. Uh, now I picked the letter up just a little bit further down, and so it was clear to me that we were not a father-grandson combination, or that I was someone helping him, no matter how the scene appeared. I was clear that God was all that was going on as this very experience. God about God's business. And that was I. And still further down the letter, it is hard to put this into words. But the living of the experience, the seeing the obstacles melt away, and seeing the what's to do appear so I could do them, and seeing the what's to do appear so I could do them. And Bill, what a wonderful what to do you gave me in the writing of experience, or writing the viewpoint. And then in knowing that that was actually living it at the moment, and then to expect confirmation, I find I can write the truth. At the moment, I'm, I may not be able to really feel the truth, but I can write it, maybe from only an intellectual basis, but I can write it. And what a great, great blessing it is to know that that small action is living it is living it. That is really such a simple exercise. But what an absolutely powerhouse activity it is, especially when it's recognized for what it is. And the other so helpful little powerhouse is the simple recognition of a small beauty, a small joy, and the recognition that in spite of all that seems to be going on, that the small beauty is the absolute evidence of the presence of God. Well, what more can we ask for? And what an humbling experience for the would-be me sins. I thank that one for allowing me to read that part of the letter. Now, may I read another from one who has corresponded. 
Dear Bill, I just felt that I had to write again. I don't quite know where to put all of this wonder and joy I'm feeling. Oh, but not in an outer way. It's like I know now. I really know and understand. And it gets stronger and stronger. All of it, this all right here, including everything I see and touch and everything, this is God's awareness. God's awareness. Nothing else besides never was nor ever can be. It's like a, a vast miracle, and yet real. Reality itself. This letter continues. Nothing to change. Nothing to get rid of it. All of it is it, and yet none of it is that. That is it. It can come and go. The scene, people, money, things, all change. But the fact that they do come and go, change or stay, that fact, that is it. That is the real. I feel like you are someone who understands what I'm saying. And this is not something that I can say to people, but I want so much to see it. So I guess you're the one. Thank God I really am right now, just writing myself. I feel blessed that I have seen, and yet to say that isn't really it either, because we are all it. That, whether we know it or not. And I see too, for, for to say I'm blessed when I know beyond a doubt that there is no me. So who is blessed? It is only natural that we see. It's right that we see. And yet, that beautiful dichotomy. It's penetrating my very being. And there is the knowledge that it doesn't make life perfect in the way people think. <laughs> in the way people think. Yet it is perfect. And who cares when it is so perfect that it includes all that is. Now, instead of me trying to change life, I want to enjoy the ride, the rocks, and the bumps, and the potholes, too. Ah, blessed life. And what is so wonderful is that to discover this is not the end of life, but a whole new journey on the other side of the mountain. I want to live it, and yet we are all living it. There can be no other living ever, ever going on. Well, it wasn't easy to get here, but it was my honesty. It was my honesty that refused all the cover-ups and all the halfwaynesses. My honesty would not let me hide. Pride was destroyed, and I saw with fear and understanding that reality is here, that really, there is no me, no one to protect, to defend, or fight for. And then I got to see, and I'm still seeing, more clearly, more for sure. I feel that I'd like to put, I'd like to put it all somewhere, but it's here inside, and all I can do is live it as best I can. And I can see how, how that helps. Well, thank you for letting me write. I'll find some place for all this energy, this inner joy. I just know I will. Well, Woodsong, listener, those, those are two recent letters of myself finally hearing, and inevitably the hearing and the seeing and the understanding comes forth in simplicity, in tender, joyful simplicity. Well, let me just make a, a little statement for myself. 
I, I think perhaps the simplest statement ever made concerning healing and prayer is found in the words of the carpenter. In all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing, ye shall receive. It's difficult to make a statement more simple than that. And yet, if it were so easily understood, why are so few prayers apparently answered? Well, it would seem because believing isn't complete enough or intense enough or whole enough. And, and why is that? Why is that, especially when people really want what they're praying for with all their might, particularly healing? Well, for me, to me, the answer came right down to the question of faith. Well, metaphysicians are wont to talk about faith. Faith, they say. Why, Christian healing is much more than a matter of faith, Mr. Samuel. But faith is very important to me. It seems to play a major role in the wonders I see in every hand. The joy of inner life and equanimity that I'm writing about for me has come on the wings of faith or trust in what? In the presence. In the presence of an ineffable Godhead right here, right now. You see, I can be conscious of a presence. I still see trees and bees and little dogs scratching fleas. But I, I can be aware of presence overspreading the whole scene. And so I trust. I believe. I have faith that behind every appearance, whatever that appearance, however it appears, is a perfect principle. Godhead. And then what do I do? I ask to be shown how appearances, whatever they are, however they're evidencing themselves, are evidencing the perfect Godhead. I ask, and it's answered. I don't think that it is possible to not be shown. It's just as Jesus said, seek and you find, ask and it'll be answered. And I'm shown, I'm given. I receive. For me, what's called healing has to do with the trustful acceptance of presence here already. Presence. And how simple that is. And how wonderful to live. And whoever is listening to this can do it. Who can do it? Because, you know, one wouldn't even be listening to this unless the child within weren't ready to completely accept fully the presence of Godhead, the presence of principle is all there is to the scene and is the only reason for the scene's appearing. Well, well, there you go. I've said it. How simple it is. And how joyful it can be. Put it to the test and see for yourself.